It is 5.30, so we will get started here. Um, welcome everyone to the January 25th Hadley Public Schools School Committee meeting. And I see we do have um, Hadley Media on, so we are recording, great. Uh, is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? Uh, yes, we have executive session on at the end of the meeting. However, um, we will be reconvening an open session immediately after executive session. Okay, great. All right. Um, then let's move into public comment. Uh, I do see some folks are still coming in. So uh, nobody's in the waiting room. Um, public comment. If you do have a public comment, please raise your digital hand as we will need to uh, allow you to unmute given the Zoom uh, security measures that we're taking for the meeting. So again, I'll just pause to allow folks to raise their digital hand if they'd like to make public comment. Okay, seeing none and seeing that Chris just joined us and he'll have plenty of time to talk with us later. <laughs> I will uh, move then into uh, out of public comment and into the presentations and discussion items. All right, our first item then for tonight is the school strategy presentations. Uh, Ms. Dowd and Ms. Camuso, I will turn it over to you guys. Thank you very much. I'm gonna start us off. April was gracious enough to let me go first. So I'd like to share my screen. Um, let me make sure that's happening. There we go. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for letting me present this evening. Thank you for allowing me to be here and to speak on the progress towards our HES strategic goals. This plan outlines the instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture, culture goals we have set for HES. The first one being the instructional leadership. For instru instructional leadership, HES continues to ensure rigor and alignment to state standards in creating instructional plans. And this year, there was an added challenge of creating and implementing both remote and in-person instructional plans. Some highlights include curriculum changes specific to this year, the first being the introduction and implementation of a new math curriculum in Visions 2020. This is our first year working with the program and the staff are participating in ongoing professional development opportunities to implement this new curriculum. For ELA, last year teachers and I participated in an early literacy grant from DESE for grades K through three. It was an opportunity to examine writing curriculum options for our youngest students and began, and we began to explore additional options for ELA program that will best meet the needs of our students. I would also like to highlight the work that's being done with our social studies curriculum team. Volunteer representatives from across the grade levels are exploring social studies programs that can enhance our current curriculum and provide a diverse and inclusive program and materials with a current worldview. All curriculum explored will be done so with a collective commitment towards creating a culturally responsive educational experience for all of our students. We will measure all curriculum options using the culturally responsive scorecard and the link is available in this document. Management and operations, just to highlight some things that are happening. Um, this year, our collective work needed to shift to address the complex, na complex nature of educating and caring for young children during a global pandemic. Opening the building to ensure the safety and health of our students and the staff was a top priority early on for all of us. Plans were created and needed resources were identified over the summer and into the start of the academic school year. I cannot thank the staff enough for the implementation of the plans that we developed over the summer. The staff worked together to think and rethink our procedures and plans, including guidelines from DESE, CDC, Board of Health and Public Safety around mass breaks, recess, drop off, pickup, schedules and technology distribution and support for both of our, both for our remote and our in-person students. 
Resources had to be allocated for instructional tools, signage for both inside and outside of the building for our new health and safety protocols to ensure safety. Some other management and operation notes center around continuing our PBIS, PBIS multi-tiered system of support. Our Hawks Wings and initiatives continue to focus on kindness. The art club this year will meet and focus on diversity initiatives. Our school council monthly meetings now include diversity and inclusion goals with some joint initiatives with the Hopkins School Council. Uh, family and community engagement. This is my favorite standard to speak on, especially when it comes to progress. My work around communication and making connections with my families is extremely important to me. The standard is ever more so important due to the circumstances around being in a global pandemic. We've worked hard to communicate with our families and engage, in commu engage a community in ways we never anticipated needing to do so. Some things to highlight are the staff and families received opportunities for feedback through surveys, emails, Zoom informational sessions, and phone calls during the first few months of this academic school year. I've also continued to provide communications and family engagement through monthly newsletters, making sure the website is current. In the fall, Ms. Camuso allowed me to join her in a joint Facebook Zoom session, which was not my favorite event, but <laughs> we shared in some, some goals and communication with families. Coordination with the PTO for our spirit wear, school, school wide spirit activities, including pajama day, school spirit days. And this week, um, if you've noticed, I'm a little looking a little tired doing principal with uh, with uh, lunch with Principal Dowd, rather, and today I had the kindergartners, so I have a, a newfound respect for my kindergarten staff trying to entertain all the kindergartners for 30 minutes while we have lunch together. I will be doing that all week with all the grade levels, and it's been fun so far. Um, and then also we have um, an upcoming event that's still in the initial planning stages, uh, it's a Zoomathon Zoom event for grades K through 12, in which we'll be coordinating with the Du Bois Center at UMass. Information about the event will be coming in mid February, with the event to take place in March. And I can present more about that later. Um, as far as professional culture, my main objective was to promote and to continue to promote an environment that is inclusive, student focused, and kind. We began our work this school year with professional development days that were centered around allowing staff to learn, organize, and communicate with each other with the collective goal of supporting students who would be both remote and in person. Some examples and opportunities that have led us to work to achieve a professional culture include creating a school culture contract with clear professional norms that were created by the staff for the staff. Committees for daily operations specific to COVID and health safety protocols, curriculum committees, input and discussions on empathy, including our empathy survey. And this year I have daily open office hours by appointment for all staff if they have any questions, concern or need anything at all. And I will continue to also work with teachers around goal setting, professional development and professional culture through the evaluation process. Uh, before I take any questions, I'd like to thank the school community, as I often do for their support, the parents who are our partners, students, staff, school committee, and Dr. McKenzie, who've supported me doing this great work for the past three years, a job that even in the most challenging times, I truly adore doing. So I can open up for questions. Anybody has any comments? I'll make a quick comment and thank you very much for the overview. Um, I would just like to thank you for your responsiveness and openness um, that has been just uh, consistent throughout this pandemic and even prior to that in terms of, um, you know, we are often asked questions as a school committee, as individuals on that committee. And we have never, um, I've never encountered an issue with getting a response quickly um, through you, through Annie, through uh, April. And I just truly appreciate the, um, the uh, responsiveness that you've always had. So thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Um, sure. And has it really been three years? It feels like yesterday. <laughs> How did that happen? I don't know. Uh, It'll okay. be three years in July. And so this, 
This, um, I remember the first um, time I presented in front of all of you, uh, some of you, and Humera, you were there. And I remember Dr. McKenzie saying, don't worry, you don't have to come to many school committee meetings. <laughs> that was I'd love to go back in time. <laughs> that was then. It was probably an empty band room too. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for this and for putting together this um, comprehensive um, list. It's amazing how much we are able to accomplish. Sometimes it feels like uh, the pandemic is all consuming and that is the only thing, but to see so much progress on other fronts, uh, it's really a testament to um, you're keeping the uh, your eye on the ball in terms of um, what our what we need from an education standpoint, from a, a culture standpoint, and um, and thank you for continuing to put great emphasis on the anti-racism work that we have just begun and will continue on into the next academic year. And I'm looking forward to making more gains with that, especially when the the global pandemic is not so all consuming. Um, and I'm looking forward to those initiatives and those goals as well. Jen, if I could just chime in, this is Paul, just to say it's always a pleasure to work with you and, and appreciate how you've handled everything this year. I've heard nothing but good things and my interactions with you have been wonderful. Just a question is, you know, what have you learned this year that you think you'd like to carry over once we get back in school? And, you know, what are the, we've, we've done a lot of new things. I'm sure there's some things that made you think, hey, this is something I want to take with me to the next stage. That's an excellent question. Um, I, I would really think, I think the communication part, um, I've really learned a lot this year about taking perspective and listening really to the school community. Um, we have such a wonderful school community and everybody has different experiences and feelings, especially during a time of stress. And so it's been really helpful to me to navigate some really difficult conversations with respect and trying to take people's perspectives um, on how they're feeling, especially when they're stressed. Um, I really will continue to have the open open door policy, although right now it's not really open because you have to wear a mask and make an appointment, but I, I, I really will continue to ask my staff to come and meet with me on a regular basis because I do feel like that's been just so helpful, especially in crafting plans. And um, I think we've really worked well creating teams. Now that we're looking at curriculum, we're looking at um, our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. So having teams of people that are willing to do the work, um, really want to be a part of the group and be problem solvers. Um, I think being a new principal, I really worked on trying to do a lot of the work by myself and um, this exercise or this year has really um, allowed me to realize how important the work is and that it, you need all hands on deck. And being in a small district, we're really blessed in that our communication can, can grow and be strong. And the teams that we put in place um, have just, it, it's incredible. I would not have been able to do the things that I needed to do this year if it wasn't for the people around me. So um, the staff, the parents, community, um, our administrative team, you all, um, it's something that I take away and I hope to continue to, to grow while I'm, I'm here. Thanks, great answer, thank you. You're welcome. I have no questions, but just to echo what everybody's already said, I've just, it, everyone's already pretty much said it, but um, <clears throat> I've just never heard anything but positive remarks and comments about you. Anytime that I talk to anybody in the HES community, parent wise, they always feel um, comfortable speaking to you. They feel comfortable reaching out to you. Um, and they always feel confident that when they leave that conversation, they're going to feel good about approaching you. So it's just, I, I just have never heard anything bad. And just to comment on something, just kudos to you for coming up with the lunch with the principal because it's something so small, but I can just imagine those kids getting so giddy because they just think it's so neat to be able to meet with their principal and have them talk. And I just, that's just really cool of you to still do that and, you know, make little, little positive little meetings with these kids to brighten up their day in a really crappy time when you're so busy. So thank you. 
You're welcome. It's the best part of being a principal um, is just the connections that you get to make with the kids. Although the kindergartners were really excited. I'm curious to see how many sixth graders are going to show up <laughs> to have lunch <laughs> with me. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get as many, but <laughs> one can hope. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll just echo what everybody said. I, I just say thank you. And uh, my only comment is that my experiences with the principal's office was were never that positive. So I don't know. I don't know what this is all about. But no, thank you for for everything you've done uh, this year for sure. Thank you. All right. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you again, April. Thanks. And I will change over to share my screen. Okay. Thanks for uh, letting me share our progress with you guys tonight. I did just want to remind everyone that the Hopkins strategy document was a one-year document. So I will be working on that again at the end of this year, going forward and developing a three-year document. The goals here were developed and reviewed by the school council and shared with the staff. Yeah, we like to highlight some progress in each standard, but not review everything that's listed here. So please let me know if you do have any questions or comments about anything that is not highlighted. I'd be happy to, to take a look at that with you. And I would like to thank the staff, administration, and community for their contributions to the project we've made. So far, as you guys all noted, it's been a challenging year. And it's always really nice when we get to talk about things and work on things that aren't always COVID related, although some of what I will highlight tonight is also COVID related as well. So to start with, I'd like to look at the first standard, which is instructional leadership. And I'd like to discuss the second goal that we had identified, which is increasing skills in teacher teaming and collaboration um, in order to increase student achievement through the development of a shared purpose analysis of student data and clear action steps. And basically what that means is that I've been working with the leadership team, which consists of department chairs, head teacher and middle school team leaders to explicitly teach them aspects of effective collaboration using um, the, the four elements of collaboration as a focus of dialogue, decision-making, action-taking and evaluation. I've also been providing observations of those department meetings then using those areas as focus and a rubric. It's the same one you guys might recall from the math PLC. So same rubric, same components of collaboration as well and working with the department around those. So I provided some observations and feedback and we'll continue those with each of the other departments. And then the departments will continue to work with their actual departments around the same skills. And hopefully we'll diffuse those skills throughout the faculty and staff in the school. The second standard, let me scroll down, that I want to take a look at is management and operations. And in this one, I'd like to talk a minute about implementing evidence-based practices that promote inclusion, diversity, dialogue, equity, community building, and conflict resolution. We've done a few different things in this area. In November, our professional development was focused around looking at our program of studies with an inclusion and equity lens. Teachers work together in groups and provided feedback on the areas where our program of studies was lacking, um, which was really, you know, down to structural and organizational pieces, to course offerings, looking at the credits that we're requiring. Um, and so we've been working on that. They actually met today for their meetings to continue working on updating that program of studies, which you guys will see hopefully at the end of February. That's my goal for where you can see some of those changes. Um, we also have been revising the student handbook, which we did earlier this year to demonstrate a more restorative justice focused approach, doing things like eliminating office detentions and replacing those more with teacher detentions so that you're building relationships and doing the repair work with the person that you might have had the issue with. We're working on our school culture as a foundation for our educational approaches around inclusion and equity, specifically thinking about trauma-informed practices, restorative justice, positive behavioral intervention supports, and other mental health supports as well. I know Jen talked a little bit about PBIS at the elementary school, and last year, I believe it was the first year that Hopkins started to work towards 
uh, building PBIS as well. And we've been doing some of that work this year and are, we'll be continuing that next year too. So I sort of took that on from Brian and, and building on the work that he had been doing around that. Um, and then another thing to look at too, our departments have been meeting and thinking again about those courses that they're offering. So some specific examples of changes that they've made. Our history department, for example, is offering a new course, Indigenous People, and have shifted from having modern AP European history to just AP world, which is a broader worldview. And in our English department, the American Lit course used to be American literature and then ethnic American literature. Um, now they're splitting it so that it's chronological and adopting a new textbook, which has a more diverse representation. So we're excited about those changes in there. The other goal I wanna take a look at is the resource goal. It's not as exciting, but it is what we've spending a lot of our time on, which is making sure that we are allocating our purchases in a way that support COVID and remote learning. So looking at document cameras and different uh, website tools like Extempor and exam.net, Equatio, which is an app where students can uh, do their math digitally in their Google document. We've been purchasing at-home lab supplies so our students can still do labs at home. And of course, we've written and revised many plans and had a lot of feedback for those plans as well. In terms of family and community engagement, lots that has been done here, but specifically, I'd like to talk about our school council. I'm gonna jump down. Uh, in, my, in my other document too, the original strategy document, there is a, a comment that points out what's a NEASC related standard. So some of you might recall that we did have NEASC visit us a few years ago. At the end of that, they left a report which gave us some instructions of things that we had to do. One of those was to do what you see here in number two, which is to develop a specific action plan regarding race, gender, and equity. So that was something that NEASC was already asking us to do about three years ago. And I know it's something um, that's currently important in our community as well. So that's what I've been spending a good amount of my time on and all of the time with the school council around. So we've developed a first draft of a logic model regarding race and gender equity. We met to discuss issues of race and equity to identify our objectives and a common vision for the Hopkins community, and then possible actions which could help support us and get those objectives to be a reality. We looked at those steps and timelines and outcomes, and I met with uh, Jen and her HES school council. We got feedback from both of the school councils on that first draft. And then I added that feedback to it. So what you see, if you guys click on this link here, is the feedback afterwards. So some of it was added to the document already. Some of it's just listed beneath. And then that will go to the staff for feedback and then for students as well before adopting and implementing that. And then our last standard to look at is professional culture. And if we look down there, we look at number two, I'd like to just take a look at improving the instructional strategies to engage our students as self-directed learners and allowing teachers to personalize instruction in line with the needs of remote learning and the principles of differentiation. So within that, we had professional development in August centered around Google Classrooms and developing an online community as well as learning lots of new tech, which was um, certainly a, a very interesting experience for everyone. This Friday, we have professional development planned, which is gonna be looking at our baseline and tier one supports for mental health. I've been working with department chairs to then work with their departments around which strategies work and which might need adjusting. And then I've provided feedback on observations for every teacher in the school, as well as on their Google Classroom. So when I do those observations, I provide feedback on both the Google Classroom itself and their instruction. And um, because Hopkins has been teaching, even when it's in the cohort remotely, all of those observations are done uh, the same way students experience them through the Google Classroom. So I kind of do that two-step thing all together. The last thing I just wanted to mention, if I could redo the strategy document and, and look back, I would have made a specific goal targeted here uh, in C4 around working with student services, teachers, and families to support the increased number of failing students and increased mental health challenges. I think we always knew it was gonna be a problem I'm not sure I could have 
predicted or envisioned how much of a problem it was going to be and how much time it was going to take for the entire staff and for families to try to address those problems. So I do think it's important to recognize that work that's being done. I facilitate the nine through 12 child study meetings and attend the seven through eight. Those are led by the middle school team leaders. We hold weekly supplemental meetings with counseling staff. Um, after reviewing data at all of those meetings and other supplemental data, such as what I've brought to you as well, we arrange support services and design specific interventions for students. I'm also in the process of designing remediation and summer programming for students who are failing courses and developing specific graduation plans for our seniors who are at risk of failing. Uh, we're holding a substance abuse forum for the entire community and those outside of Hadley with counselors, a guest speaker, and our school resource officer in February on the 9th. And school counselors are holding two open student forums, first one tomorrow for high school students to talk about stressors related to COVID. And all of that work, again, is continuous, such as the PD that I mentioned and recognizing that we have to take a slightly different approach to address students' mental health concerns as those are not going to suddenly evaporate anytime soon. So I did want to mention that one. I know it's not in the original document, but it is an important piece of what we're doing. Uh, and of course, was an issue prior to COVID and has become worse because of that. So if anyone has any questions or comments about any of the areas, I would be happy to take those now. I'll just add, I, I appreciate your acknowledgement of the social and emotional health um, work that's being done and that needs to be done and calling that out specifically. So thank you. Just chime in April and just say, I think you've done a wonderful job of given a really crazy first year as an interim and now permanent uh, principal. So we're lucky to have you and thank you for stepping up. Thanks. I'm sure that's not how you imagined your first year would be. <laughs> no. It's only going to get easier then from now on. So I guess so. Yeah, yeah, that is. I talked to Ms. Chapman earlier today and that's what she told me. So yeah. I'll go with that. <laughs> Good. Yeah, you're stepping into uh, this work at uh, such an important time, and we are lucky to have you be able to take that uh, year's approach to a three-year uh, um, expanded view. So thank you for that. And it's um, heartening to see, um, you know, I kind of forgot, I, I, NIASC came back with such a dense set of recommendations, mm -hmm. and I didn't, um, I kind of forgot that, uh, DEI work was one of those. Uh, at some point, it would be good to go back and look at all of the the other ones. Um, but I'm glad to hear that uh, that it's aligned with what they recommended. Yeah, and we do have a report due. I believe it's in May that I'll be uh, submitting. Um, yes. So I, I guess if you guys want to read that exciting report, you can. And uh, the other standard is curriculum and instruction. And originally I was gonna do some work around that as well. And my school council advised me to be more realistic and to pay a little more attention to COVID. And so that's that's a little bit in the works this year, but then more so next year. Great. I don't have any questions either, but just to again echo um, everybody else's sentiments. And I do feel very lucky that we, uh, fortunate that we have you on as the principal and thank you for um, staying on and taking that on. And I just, I'm always very impressed um, anytime you present at how thorough um, uh, you are in your reports and your reviews and um, just your dedication to the students. It's just very evident and I just appreciate that. Thank you. Again, yes to all of that. Great work so far. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you both, uh, April and Jen, for the information on the school strategy presentations. Anything else that you'd like to add or Annie you'd like to add on these? Uh, just also to say how grateful I am for the leadership in both of our buildings. These folks have demonstrated an ability to plan, to communicate, to collaborate, to balance what sometimes can be competing needs of a wide range of stakeholders and sometimes just different. Um, they've done that with kindness and with genuine interest in what people bring to the table. 
and they've done a phenomenal job. And they've also demonstrated a willingness to adapt. I do want to echo that um, Ms. Dowd was a principal for a whopping 18 months before COVID hit. And uh, Ms. Camuso has never been a principal outside of COVID. Uh, so <laughs> this, is, this is really challenging work in these times for um, relatively new administrators. I, I've been an administrator, I think now for over 20 years. And uh, I was thrown off my game in many days. I was more thrown off my game than Ms. Camuso and Ms. Dowd. So I just wanna echo the thanks that the school committee has expressed very good work. And thank you to your staff uh, for helping you. I know that you say all the time, we don't do this work alone. We do this work with others. And so you have phenomenal teams of faculty and I appreciate their work as well. And we can go on to the budget. Now, if we'd like, I can share my screen. So this is I the will say, fiscal year 22 budget. Yes, uh, well, that would be helpful if I had it up. Let's try this, hold on. Share screen. I'll get to the budget summary, hold on. Let's go here to start with. Okay, so, First, just to review what we were charged with, meaning what the town asked us to do. It's important for people to remember that although the school department has an independently elected board that ultimately oversees all of the finances for the school department, we are a department within the town and we have a vested interest in working collaboratively with our town to ensure that we allocate all of the town's resources in a way that achieves our desired results and in a way that demonstrates fiscal responsibility. I'm pleased to report we were asked to develop a level services budget and a level funded budget. A level services budget says if you maintain the level of service that you are currently providing, what would it cost? A level funded budget asks the question, what happens if funding were exactly the same as last year. What's important to remember in a school department budget, there are total operating expenses, and then there's local contribution. The local contribution is the portion of the budget that the town provides. I think it's important to remind people and always to thank the town for its support of its schools and its generosity. Hadley has consistently and historically funded its schools well above what is mandated by the Commonwealth. In putting together a level services budget, the FY22 total budget, at this point, I also want to underscore that this is preliminary and in draft form. Remember, we go through multiple iterations and we finally have a public hearing on the budget in April. I wanted to make sure that this initial presentation, the school committee had an opportunity to weigh in, provide any feedback, because I have a meeting with the town administrator uh, later this week, Wednesday or Thursday, to review the school department budget. So if there are any adjustments the school committee would like to see in this preliminary budget, it'd be important for me to have those before I meet with the town. The entire budget for the town is not finalized until the first Thursday in May, a town meeting. So in this preliminary draft, a level services budget Actually, we are able to do that, the FY22 total budget at uh, just over eight and a half million dollars. This represents a $21,500 decrease from FY21 in total operating expenses. However, for local contribution, in order to have a level services budget, it would require roughly seven and a half million dollars in local contribution that represents just about a $54,000 increase from FY21. It's an increase of less than 1% of 0.73%, but it would not be uh, level funding of local contribution. What are we trying to do with the budget? As you've heard from both of the principals, anytime we invest our time or funds in an activity, we wanna make sure that we're allocating resources in a way that aligns with our stated vision, our theory of action, and our stated priorities and objectives. 
So you've heard that we're really focused on ensuring that we create educational environments that foster cooperation, critical thinking, creativity, and integrity. We value diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we believe that if we build, continue to build educator expertise, a shared vision of effective teaching, that if we implement evidence-based practices that foster deep learning and strong relationships, and we use data effectively and partner with families around our work, then we will increase achievement, engagement, and equity. The strategic priorities you see here were also in the school improvement or strategy documents. So what are we recommending investing in in fiscal year 22? We think it is critical that we invest uh, additional resources in contracted services for technology. As you all know, we have invested in many, many devices and it will be imperative even post COVID and post COVID won't be a, as we know, a flip the switch and whoa, everything's right back to normal. There'll be some lingering effects of this though um, that may require uh, some students to, we may see increased absences next year. It may remain critical for students to have access um, to materials and resources outside of school. So in this initial pre preliminary budget, we've significantly increased um, support uh, in, in, and by support specifically contracted services to support the maintenance, repair, um, and setting up of various devices. Support for high quality college and career pathways. Um, we have budgeted and we budget for this based on historical three-year averages for enrollment. So that $433,000 represents um, our projected tuitions for Smith Vocational School. And we've also included stipends for coordination of early college high school and innovation pathways, internships, and service learning, as these are critical components of creating high quality college and career pathways in the district. We are always committed to providing access to a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment for students with disabilities. There are times where the least restrictive environment is not one of our campuses. So we estimate our tuition payments for out-of-district placements next year to be roughly $450,000. Again, let me underscore how preliminary this budget is. A lot can change between January and June. A lot can change in mid-year as well as summer programming for eligible students with disabilities. So students who are entitled to extended school year services per their individual education plan. We have invested in a highly qualified teaching and support staff. It's important that uh, for everyone to realize that the secondary teaching faculty in this budget includes the replacement of an ELA position, English language arts, that was not filled in fiscal year 21. This is a position that was previously held by Ms. Camuso. The development, so that's not a new position, it's making sure we had the positions that we had in fiscal year 20. Development of a specialized program at Hopkins Academy to meet the needs of students with intensive disabilities, that would require one additional teaching position. Uh, in terms of when I meet with the town, the town has been, has emphasized the importance of not adding additional positions. However, if we don't create programs in-house, uh, it it is more expensive typically to provide an education in an out of district placement. So by creating an in-house program, it typically runs about half the cost. And it also allows students to remain with us, which is really what we want if the team agrees with that. We want members of our community to graduate from our schools because they're a part of our community. We miss them when they're not here. And salary increases in accordance with collective bargaining agreements. And salary adjustments and regional data demonstrate that the Hadley Public Schools pay scales are significantly less than comparable positions in the region. And this has been something that the school committee has remained committed to. And I have to say, it makes me very proud to work here, um, that people act on the belief that individuals should be paid a competitive wage if we expect them uh, to work hard and our folks work hard. In addition, this budget invests in resources to support high quality curriculum instruction and assessment. This is critical given the, COVID, the effect COVID-19 has had on achievement, growth, and mental health. And so there are stipends for curriculum coaches at HES. You know, the, the Hawkins Academy 
has department chairs and they're extremely helpful in, in helping um, implement and evaluate curriculum and assisting folks with instructional questions. Um, so these, I've included stipends for curriculum coaches at Hadley Elementary School, stipends for social and emotional development, uh, that should say coach at each school, and stipends for child study team facilitators. Resources to support our commitment to fostering a diverse, equitable, inclusive, and anti-racist organization, instructional materials for anti-racist education, diversity, equity, and inclusion coach in each school, and evaluation of programs to identify policies, practices, and programs that exacerbate inequity. It's important to note in those coaching positions, those are not additional FT, uh, full-time equivalents, but rather they would be posted for our current faculty and staff to apply if they were interested and felt like they were qualified to fulfill those roles. And the question, since I am expected to provide the town with a, I need to move this, excuse me folks. Um, I am expected to provide the town, as I said, level funding and level service. So to get to the invest, investments I've just delineated, that would require an increase of just under 1% in local contribution if uh, the town determined that all departments would be level funded next year. You can see that that would probably affect our ability to provide additional contracted services support and technology and the likelihood that we could hire, um, invest in various the various coaching positions that I've presented. And um, the overview, um, one thing I'll point out to you, and again, this is very preliminary, it doesn't get really close to being finalized until we're closer to April. Um, this here, the administrative technology and support, I just wanna point out that if you look down at instructional technology, we moved roughly $25,000 of expenses that were usual, that were previously in that category. We recoded them in order to make those expenses align with the account, the accounts, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education accounting codes. So we just essentially moved about $25,000 out. You might be saying, uh, you said 25,000, why does that look like a deduction of more like 20? Um, because this is one of the places where we made some other adjustments to the budget. And then up here, if you add 20 plus that roughly $60,000 in, um, $60,000 in contracted services, additional contracted services that I'm recommending plus some increases to lines, more minimal increases to lines within uh, that particular, what's called a function subtotal, that's where you see that increase of $84,000. I just wanted to point that out because it shows us a 100% increase. Um, and here on food services, I don't want you to read this as we don't have food services anymore, that we had last year placed food services, uh, some of the expenses in food services in the operating budget, because as we know, sometimes when we review our revolving accounts, it's very, very hard for food services to break even. Not that they don't do their darndest to try to break even, they do great work, but it's challenging. However, because of the federal funding that we've received during the pandemic, food service is actually performing quite well. And we believe that next year we can treat it like an enterprise fund. An enterprise fund is defined as a fund in which the fees actually cover the costs of running the program. So we believe that that would be possible. Food service accounts should be treated as enterprise funds. We've just constantly, as the school committee knows, at the end of the year had to make a, a budget adjustment in order to move money out of operating and into that revolving account. We believe that next year, we probably won't need to do that based on what we're seeing right now in that revolving account. Um, and again, you see at the bottom, the total budget actually decreased. So the town asked for a level, level funding. I mean, technically, uh, the total operating expenses are level or slightly less, um, but it never matches exactly with local contribution. 
And I'm certainly happy to take any questions or if the school committee would simply prefer to deliberate about whether or not there's anything you would like me to do differently prior to meeting with the town. Again, this does not require a vote because we're nowhere near a final budget. Just a comment, Annie. Uh, I appreciated seeing the difference um, in the vocational uh, tuition as well as the um, special education tuition, which obviously, you know, part of that would be offset by the position that you mentioned in terms of being able to retain folks in district um, and just modeling what you saw last year, right, from reduced mm -hmm. Smith vocational tuition. So um, being able to just plan for that in the budget here, uh, you know, results in about $300,000 less uh, right there, right, in terms of budgeted amounts. So I like seeing that out front there, especially given some of the discussions that we had um, last fiscal year about, you know, where we could return money to the town. Here, we're trying to plan for and model from what you have seen already in, in practice. And I get that, you know, it's not set in stone. Um, some of these things are variable, but I'm, I'm glad that we've got kind of a um, conservative estimate here. And just as a reminder to the school committee, last year in fiscal year 21, we requested a, I believe, 1.69, or for this fiscal year, we requested a 1.69% increase to local contribution. So that still is a very um, reasonable, moderate increase. That doesn't mean that I take the town's investments in its schools lightly, but it, it is reasonable. Um, and we also will be, because our vocational tuitions that we had originally budgeted for are far less than we anticipated, we will be, the school committee voted to be, to return money to the town to help them address a looming um, kind of fiscal problem that they were having this fiscal year. Um, I will also report that right now our school choice uh, balance, which we have school choice that we need to apply. And we also have some money that will be returned to the town for the reasons I just described. But school choice, that program is doing better than it has ever in the history of Hadley Public Schools. So I really want to thank, I've said this a million times, I'll say it again. Students don't, nobody says to a child, hey, what district do you go to? They ask them what school they go to. And so it's the individuals who work in schools that make those places inviting. Thank you very much to our faculty, to our staff, and to our administrators. Uh, school choice receiving, people choosing Hadley at an all-time high, and we're seeing a consistent and steady decline in school choice sending or school choice going out. Those charts will be presented to you uh, at the public hearing of the budget. That's great, Annie. Can, pretty, I'm sorry, here, Mary, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say this is pretty great uh, uh, news in light of the fact that so, uh, there's so much uh, economic uncertainty uh, all around the fact that we're able to be at level services, enhance the areas uh, in our curriculum instruction and services that we wish to enhance and come out under from an overall annual budget uh, town ask standpoint. Uh, my question is, have we floated this by our town colleagues at all for some early uh, feedback. So that's what I, that is what will happen when I meet with the town administrator. Actually, my meeting is with the town administrator and public safety, the uh, public safety and the town administrator and the school department will get together. Those are the, probably the most expensive departments in town. So that first discussion will happen, as I said, it's either Wednesday or Thursday. And uh, then I imagine after that, they'll request presentations at finance committee, which Ethan, Heather, or anyone can attend those finance uh, committee meetings. I'm sure they'll ask some more questions um, and we'll just start putting the pieces together on the town side. The town does have a, a, quite a challenge in front of it. Um, COVID has significantly imp impacted meals and occupancy rates and those revenues in town. And that reminds me, I also want to thank, we're, we're still continuing these conversations, but um, it, I would argue that Hadley Public Schools has without a doubt the most thoughtful, intelligent, and reasonable labor force that, that exists. And I, I really mean that. And so these are people that understand what it means to work as a team with the town 
and that uh, the fiscal health of the town translates into the fiscal health of each of its departments. So uh, we are quite fortunate in that regard. So I'll keep you posted after I meet with the town administrator and I imagine we're meeting again next Monday because that's, that's what we do. Um, so I'll update you then. Thank you. So Annie, I apologize if you said this and I missed it. If our total budget request is going down, why is the local contribution going up? Uh, because some places that has to do with revenues. So our revenue streams are pretty limited in, uh, our, our revenue streams are pretty limited in, in public education, right? We don't, we don't have any big sales. It's all that massive. So we rely predominantly on the town to cover the majority of our revenues. You see, there's just only about a million dollars. The town covers just about everything but a million dollars and very graciously. The other places we look for revenues are Circuit Breaker. Circuit Breaker is the program that reimburses us for expenses in special education when expenses associated with the student who has an individual education plan exceed what's called four times the foundation rate. That's roughly exceed roughly $44,000. Then the circuit breaker program says all expenses above that, the school department in the law, I believe, and later Chris can correct me, I believe the law was written as 0.75, 75%. And although it rarely is fully funded, like many things that we see in educational finance. You can see our out of district tuitions have decreased and like, call out our incredible special educators, regular educators, but really this ability to create programs that the meet the needs of students within our public schools it takes a whole team of educators. We all educate all children, but it really takes the specialized knowledge of our director of special education and, um, and her team, the special educators. We've done a great job of that. Those, but when those go down, our circuit bracer reimbursement also goes down right? Because we're not hitting those thresholds if we're keeping students in district. Um, some people might wonder, well, then isn't the incentive really to, to, but remember it isn't. One, because least restrictive environment is probably the most important thing to me. I, I want to be the destination district of families who have children with disabilities. I want to be the place that people talk about that educates children with disabilities in the least restrictive environment and does it well. But also that the circuit breaker reimbursement doesn't happen until you hit that threshold, right? So you hit that threshold and you only get a percentage of it, but that's one of the issues. So that revenue in FY22, we estimate will decrease by $75,000. Mm -hmm. um, we do anticipate an increase slight in our Title I, Title IIA and Title IV grants. That's good news. Um, and we are increasing the amount of school choice that uh, we plan to apply to the budget. But a place where we had a significant decrease in our, our current plan, like our revenue analysis, is preschool. And you can imagine why, not because they are not working incredibly hard, but uh, COVID is not preschool friendly at all. And so we really have had to limit the number of students who can access that program based on the requirements for COVID. And in fiscal year 21, we estimated applying $120,000 of preschool revenues to the budget. And in fiscal year 22, we anticipate applying 50,000. So that's a $70,000 increase there, uh, or decrease rather, excuse me there. And so just even in circuit breaker and, and preschool revolving, you see that decline in revenues. And again, that's why you can have these two things that don't seem to make sense. You know, your overall can go down, but um, you need to rely on your other revenue streams and, and really that school choice and local contribution. And we did increase school choice. We're assuming uh, applying, again, around $800,000 to school choice. Um, and so, um, you know, we are adding more school choice and it's just, we have limited places where we can get revenue from to cover the total budget. Does that make any sense? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Yeah. All right. It's a lot of ridiculous lingo, foundation and reimbursements. And My favorite is circuit breaker. It seems to have nothing to do with what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so. Is the school committee comfortable with this? Again, not for a vote, but there's this is okay to 
to bring to the town administrator. I'm fine with this is the this is the yes. starting point initial draft. I mean, I think you've outlined all of the considerations and I trust that this is not the last time we'll be talking about the budget. So let's start it. Perfect. Great. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, just going back to the agenda here. Sorry, scrolling. Yeah. Review of public health data which will also lead into the COVID-19 testing updates. Yep. Uh, let me get here. Let's do here. Oh, come on, Annie. Um, and this is just a, of course, folks are seeing these data, right? In the... All right, so let's try to find something positive, shall we? Um, testing positivity rate in Hampshire County went uh, down, so, but um, and we saw a slight decrease in the average daily incidence rate. But the truth is that these numbers still remain rather high, and um, I know that it's understandably concerning for um, the entire community and faculty and staff. And what we have seen in Remember, these are just, for the most part, surrounding areas. The, the folks, the districts in blue are those that we play sports with. So this is the last three weeks. And the first column, now I can't remember if it's staff or student, I gotta look again. So students are in the first number there. I guess I could have frozen that. And staff are the second number. So in, this, in just these districts, in the last three weeks, student cases, have been two. Now these are only in places where somebody has been physically present in the building for the last seven days. So as you know, I still send out emails to the entire community if somebody is remote and we know of a positive case. But some of these places may have had remote cases. We don't know that. Um, so two, six, and then it stayed at six for students. And for faculty in the last three weeks, faculty and staff who have been present in buildings in the previous seven days, uh, two, nine and then three. When you added the um, case count to the first tab as well. I did. I'll go back to that. I know because I'm sure it was confusing for folks who were getting unfortunately what seemed like back-to-back -back emails from me. So let me get that down there. Um, yeah. So confirmed positive cases. I will update this. Um, I've got to make sure yeah, I got to make sure it's up to date right now. I think that's I think that's 100%. But um, I'll verify that with the nurses tomorrow. So check back frequently there, and if there's something that I was missing, it'll be adjusted. Um, it'll be adjusted by tomorrow. I was going to add, Annie, I know you announced this, but um, we could probably remove the flu vaccine tracking numbers. We were tracking that previously uh, due to the end of year um, original uh, mandate, but that has yeah. since been lifted. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. be putting efforts in tracking that at this point. Yeah, I will update that as well. Annie, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I've had people ask me this and I don't know the answer. So um, it's a two part question. One, are schools uh, legally required to report their, um, their data of um, number of instances for students and staff to the state, which is where we collect our data from, but are they legally required? That's question number one. And then number two, um, are parents, say you have a kid, very symptomatic, they have COVID. Are they legally required? Of course, it's unethical not to say anything to the school, but are they legally required to say something to the school? I'm really glad you asked these two questions. So one, I don't I don't know if it's legally required for us to report. Like I, I don't know what kind of sanctions would be imposed on us if we didn't, but we do it. It's been requested. The state has told us this is what you should do. So anytime we have a case, we report it to the state. Um, and, and then the state, the numbers that you see, again, on the, 
these are only the state only reports. And remember, anything you see in this dashboard, you can go to the original source. There's a link to the original source. The state only reports those st students or staff who've been in the building in the last seven days. With regard to your second question, I don't believe that there is a law, if I am mistaken, I will correct this at our next meeting, that requires families to report to us. But I am glad that you asked because I implore, I beg families, even if you think, well, it doesn't matter, my kid's been remote. It's really helpful. Little things. We keep a running list of materials pickup. Child comes in for materials pickup. People, if they get, if they come into the building for anything, if they interact with any staff members, we write everything down. And if it was just a run in and run out, then it probably wouldn't constitute a close contact. But please, please, please inform us uh, when your child or when your child tests positive. If a student in our public school system tests positive for COVID, please inform the school nurse. Um, we just want to make sure that we have done everything we possibly can to contact Trace um, and let others know if they were a close contact. And in doing so, to protect other people and to slow the spread. That's the whole point of that. Reporting cases is about slowing the spread. So thank you for asking that, Humera. And I really, please, families, um, please tell us. I asked the question in part because I, I wonder if there are other feedback loops that prevent us from not knowing like, you know, whether the, whether Cooley Dick would let us know or uh, public health or the local pediatrician's office. There, there isn't, I guess privacy concerns would prevent them from telling us. Uh, so I think there's no foolproof way. And I, I suspect that there's probably some stigma to saying, oh yeah, you know, we got the Rona or, you know, because I just, I did see what happened at the, a high school level amongst peers to uh, immediately the students are asking one another, do you know who it is? Do you know who it is? Is it you? Is it you? Who's out of class? They're all trying to triangulate on who it is. And I wonder what that does to people's um, proclivity to actually report out honestly. Yeah. So I would say um, a couple of things. One is that if the, if the contact tracing collaborative identifies the school as a place where the individual may have had close contacts, we will get that information even if we don't get it from a parent. The problem is we might get it rather late, right? So we could prevent a lot of other folks having to quarantine sometimes. And, and I also say this because it is confusing. It is confusing. You're, you're, I, I have shared the chart many times of when to isolate, when to quarantine, what happens if I live with somebody who's positive? What happens if I'm a close contact? What happens if I'm a contact of a contact? And it's still incredibly confusing. The, the nurses and I, when I'm assisting with this, I have to sit at a calendar and say, okay, what's day zero? And we got to count. When are they free? It's not on day 10. It's actually on day 11. So it can be very confusing. And if families would you know, contact us in addition to any other reporting that they're doing, we want to help people sort it out and we want to help them keep their entire family safe and give them all the information that we have. In terms of young people trying to figure it out or anybody, sometimes it's adults who are going on this kind of Perry Mason-esque quest, quest to figure out who it is. Um, I understand that human beings are naturally curious. I'm going to presume that that comes from not a gossipy kind of place, but from a place of, oh my gosh, I wanna be doubly sure that my children were not a close contact or I wasn't a close contact. That's usually what's motivating people wanting to know. Um, I would just say um, maybe that human tendency can't be suppressed, but to your point, Humera, nobody should feel stigmatized. I mean, we all do our best and unless you're going to feel guilty about breathing, I mean, because in some cases, yes, we have a mask and we have other things, but I mean, this is a, a something that People can become infected um, by being close to somebody who has COVID-19 and sneezes or coughs or whatever that is. And it doesn't take long, right? It takes just cumulative 15 minutes over a 24-hour period. So nobody should feel as though they did something that brought this upon themselves. That is, that's just absurd. I mean, I, I also encourage people to be 
careful, to be mindful. We all have fatigue around this. Please, please, please keep wearing your mask. Keep socially distancing or physically distancing. Keep washing your hands. Keep refraining from going places you don't need to go. We have almost rounded the corner on this, um, but certainly don't feel like you have to hide it if you have it because you did something wrong. Um, we just want to help everybody to get healthy and to keep others healthy. Yeah, I was just curious if you think, just looking through the district data that you put together, which is really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I can't discern really any patterns and, and it's almost meaning, you know, the last couple of weeks, maybe there's been elevated levels, but that's, they're not in, kids aren't in school. Right? Are you looking, I'm sorry, Paul, are you looking at what I have up right now? Put it back. I went back to your whole data set there, back to the bat, this one when it started. Oh, no, here, Paul. The Paul. September, starting from September. Yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah, it's just, you know, I can't find, it's lower in the fall, starts picking up, but it's even, it peaks even a little bit before Thanksgiving. Has it really even peaked now? But kids aren't even in school, you know, so our cases clearly aren't in school transmission. They're our, our community out of school. And I'm assuming that's the same for others, unless these other schools are in, I guess I don't know what Ethel is doing. Yeah, so some are, some aren't, and some have, you know, and some for some it changes. These, uh, this is really pathetic, so I spend a lot of time putting these data into this dashboard, but I would argue perhaps these two sheets are not the most helpful, but I'm trying to be more helpful than just saying to parents, hey, if you're interested, go to this website and look it up yourself and download the Excel spreadsheet. Right. So, because the Excel spreadsheets, they only do it each week individually, right? So you can't see it across the board. And because the department collects these data, I assume that there is some public interest in the data, but in yeah. terms of drawing conclusions from it is particularly challenging with these two because we don't know right? Yeah. We don't know who's in, who's out on any given day, what model they have. Um, Do we have any record of in-school transmission? Like where seems to have last couple of weeks that had a bunch of cases? Do we know if they're uh, in school? I, I don't know. Uh, perhaps later in the program, somebody could weigh in on that, but I don't want to make them wear two hats. <laughs> um, so one of our presenters might know that, but I certainly don't want to make them. Uh -huh. Yes, of course. Um, but uh, so I don't know. It just changes so quickly, Paul. Yeah. I just okay. yeah, realized that I admitted that I spend a lot of time on something that I just called relatively useless, but perhaps interesting. <laughs> I don't know what I I'll mean, do. It's interesting that year. there's no there's it, there's no clear pattern. I mean, you'd have mm -hmm. to dive into the data much deeper to find if, to see if there's a pattern. But yeah. Yep. Okay. And so uh, testing. I don't have, and I certainly don't want to steal any thunder here, Paul. I mean, I'll just start with a few things about uh, what we've learned about pool testing and where the conversations are with some faculty representatives. So I went to the second, just so folks who are watching or listening, just to help them remember what is pool testing. So pool testing is when a, a pool or a group of um, specimens, so you collect specimens. In this case, this type of testing is called anterior nasal swab. So it isn't, they make it very clear, it isn't the, oh my goodness, did someone just touch my brain swab, but anterior nasal swab, so a bit less intrusive. And you collect, a pool could be as small as five, it could be as large as 25. The pool goes out, the individual specimens are not identified in the initial data uh, specimen collection. If the pool comes back and the results from the pool, they're tested at a lab, those results come back typically in 24 to 48 hours. If the pool comes back positive, every individual who is in that pool then takes what's called a, a rapid point of care antigen test. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has recommended the use of the Abbott Binnix Now test for that. All the folks in that pool get tested so you can identify who the positive is. And in the unlikely event that everybody in the pool came back individually negative, but the pool had read positive, then everyone in the pool has to go to an additional PCR test. Um, it isn't assumed that it's wrong just when that discrepancy exists. So 
we learned about it from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Right now, they're prepared to launch um, pool testing in districts across the Commonwealth and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed. I'm gonna say DESE from now on. DESE has offered to pay for the costs associated with it for the first six weeks. They're inviting districts to, if districts do the required preliminary work to participate, they are um, saying that districts can join anytime as early as early February through the beginning of March. Districts do not have to, 100% of the district does not have to join. A single school could participate in pool testing, so it does not have to be district-wide. Um, and so our school nurses have participated in these webinars with me, and uh, I met with our administrative team and um, several teacher representatives from both buildings, individuals who have participated and done a lot of work on the reopening plans. Um, and we did not come to any sort of definitive conclusion. And earlier today, I forwarded to the school committee responses from districts around us. And it also doesn't seem as though it's a definitive, everybody's on board for pool testing. I really want the public to understand, I have not changed my mind about the importance and value of testing. Neither, none of the faculty uh, with whom I spoke said, oh yeah, Peshaw testing, that's crazy talk. They all recognize that testing and tracing are incredibly important aspects of infection control done well. Here were some of the questions that we had. One was, at what rate, and we don't have an answer to this yet, how much participation do you need for this to be meaningful? Because it requires consent for everybody. No, it cannot be imposed on anyone, not on faculty, not on staff, and not on any student. So what if you established a pool and your pool, I'm gonna use the elementary school for now just because it's, it's easy to do, right? Or even the grades of the high school, let's say because there, are, there is a lot of overlap in schedules for students in the same grade. So if you establish a pool or two pools within a grade level at the high school, um, you establish a pool for each class at the elementary school. What happens if 50% of that class don't participate? How valuable is the information in terms of what it means for, um, how, you know, how useful is that in increasing the, safe, the safety and health of faculty and staff and other students? So let me say that again. What testing is always good for, always good for is this type of testing is designed to pick up infected asymptomatic people. That is helpful, right? The sooner you pick that up, the less likely you are to have school spread. What we've seen is mitigation strategies in schools make school spread far less likely. So really what you're doing, which I believe in doing this, is you're doing, um, you're doing a service to the community right, by picking up infected asymptomatic people, because when people leave school, they may be more inclined, like they may relax a little bit on the mask wearing, on other things around the house, in the neighborhood. I'm not saying I want that to happen, but I'm a realist, it could happen. So picking up asymptomatic infected people is a benefit for the community. But we also asked what you know, how much investment of time and effort, now the first six weeks are paid for, the following six weeks, the estimate that we came up with, it's $5 a swab. So it would cost for the remaining time in school if 100% of people participated, I'm not saying they would. This, this specimen testing, the initial test, and not any follow-up testing, would run us roughly $40,000 the remainder of the year, but that does not take into consideration the costs associated with outsourcing the logistical end. We only have two school nurses. Their primary responsibility is to be a school nurse and not to enter data in a software program to manage a testing regimen. Um, so we would, $40,000 could potentially be a low end cost. So our questions were, so, for the amount of effort it would take in a district with our capacity, is this the most logical move or should we be looking at perhaps one idea that um, I threw out to a faculty member was, might we be able to incentivize families, particularly at the high school level or students themselves, 
and employees to utilize existing community testing sites for asymptomatic people and share those data with us. Right? So that was one idea. Is it and and what are the benefits of doing that, right? Do we actually inculcate a habit in somebody that they are willing to carry on even when they're not in school? So we have not definitively determined what makes the most sense. There is time to decide. I know the school committee has some thoughts on this. And I also want to say after that meeting, um, our, some of our teacher representatives offered to work with me to come up with a survey that we could use to get a sense of how many staff would be interested, what other kinds of testing protocols they think would make sense, how likely, these are anonymous surveys, nobody has to, you know, it's nobody, we can't force testing, so it'll be anonymous, we just want people to be truthful, um, and also ask staff if they have ideas about other ways, again, to encourage people to participate in asymptomatic testing um, that may be more logical for a district our size. Um, and we will also be asking parents their thoughts on this too, the likelihood that they would give consent for their children to participate, if they have feelings about the type of testing, if there's a way, if we incentivized behavior for high schoolers, what do parents think about that? And that's all I have on testing. Paul, I'm sure you have some thoughts as well. So uh, I've just been taking a little bit different tack and, and coordinating with Andy on this, but I did communicate with UMass again. Um, they're still considering, they're, they're hesitant. The, just the logistical onslaught they face with the students coming back is significant, right? And so for us to add in X number of hundreds of extra PCR cases is daunting for them. And again, I try to push and say, well, logistically, if there are challenges, how, how can we figure those out? Do you, challenges about collecting the specimens, challenges about them entering the specimens into their database. Uh, and then of course, their lab challenges, can they process the, the samples? They can't do pooled sam sampling, it's just individual PCR tests. You know, so one thing we talked about as well, could we do PCR tests with some subsection of our community, whether it's just all the faculty and administrators or faculty administrators in Hopkins, you know, creating more, what are targeted areas where there might be more risk? Assuming even if we had the pull testing, you complement that. So I kind of threw all the scenarios on the table and that was last week, UMass was gonna get back to me. Annie and I have been talking, are there other labs out there? I mean, I, I, to me, it's just sort of, we've got pull testing is, is a box that we should, a tool we should think about. It's nice that the state is offering Taking a step back, I'd love to hear your all's perspective. I'd love to hear the faculty, the staff's perspective. Is there a testing protocol that we could design that would allow us to get back into schools and make people feel safe doing so? What's that? And then let's go figure out how to get that. We're gonna have federal funds. Granted, finding places to test hundreds of samples a week is not easy. But if that's the box we're trying to get, you know, let's figure that out first, as opposed to, Concentrating on pulled sampling, which I, I understand is not a solution necessarily. It's, it's maybe a piece of the puzzle. But so when you I understand asking folks, well, would they do it? I think I love the idea of incentivizing because whatever we come up with, we're going to need participation. But, it, you know, is that the right surveillance mechanism? Is pool testing once a week the right surveillance mechanism? Is coupling that with something else a better mechanism? We're just saying we're not going to do pool testing. We're just going to do individual PCR testing once a week with this population, because that gets us to the, the comfort we want. Those are the kinds of questions I'd love to get feedback on. Uh, so, I, go ahead. Oh, Tara, you, do you want to go first or do you want me to? I just was going to give a little bit of history to those people who don't, who may not have followed along with why we even went down this road. You go ahead. Okay. Um, well, so it was last fall when there was a great article that was published and another um, school committee, Lincoln Sudbury, came out with a resolution that said, hey, there are inexpensive uh, tests that might allow us the assuredness as a community to move more quickly through the phases. Um, and and the, that idea of, you know, tests that exist in other countries, a dollar per, you know, pee on a stick kind of tests uh, that could be readily uh, at hand and just um, give us more knowledge about what was going on in our community so we weren't so blind and finding out days later that 
um, that infection had spread and close contacts needed to be traced. And so we passed that resolution and we've been exploring the possibilities I have to say, so the, the state first came out with a, we'll give you a machine, you can do your own testing. It turned out to be pretty onerous, very expensive, required uh, people. And that's the one that they're uh, suggesting that, 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 that kind of device be used for pool testing. Um, and, and then we found out that UMass is doing testing in house like many colleges are. They have so many uh, students, they wanna test very regularly. They're a money-making business. They have to keep things running. Um, and a lot of universities have come up with really easy saliva tests and such that uh, make it quick and easy and affordable to test in mass and have that assuredness. And so thank you, Paul, for leading the discussion at UMass. And I think we should still continue to um, try as they become more confident in rolling out those tests amongst their larger population as students come back, that we will have had that conversation be ready and waiting in the queue in order you know, to be able to utilize those services. And, and I've been woefully disappointed with the state's uh, suggestion to do pool testing. I read the document that was sent and it just, the analogy that comes to mind is like a leaky dam. You, you try to plug one hole and another, you know, the hole gets leaks even further in the sense that, um, you know, you, you test the one, one class of the fourth grade in, in one day, but then, you know, your sixth graders might have a, a case or your 12th graders or your ninth graders. It just seems impossible to, uh, to have an N that is high enough, sufficient enough to give us a complete picture of what is actually happening on the ground fast enough. So the solution they've put forth in my mind just doesn't uh, uh, speak to the, um, the spirit of what it was that we were trying to achieve in the first place. And I think we just need to keep looking. That's my personal opinion, um, not as a healthcare provider, but more as a undergraduate, math major, statistician, uh, it just does not seem to really get at what we need. So Tara, I'd love your perspective as a healthcare person. Um, so I think for the, there's a lot going on here right now, right? There's a lot of different thoughts and a lot of different perspectives and just a lot of information. And I, I really think before we can make any decisions about which avenue we go down, we really need to figure out um, or get a good idea of what our participation level would be, because I think that that would help us figure out um, how worthwhile um, any avenue that we're going to take would be. You know, if you're if you're finding out that a lot of parents in the elementary school are really unwilling to consent to their child getting tested, but the teachers are really adamant and excited that that's something, yes, I absolutely would participate, then maybe doing something like a weekly PCR test at the elementary school just for staff, if we can get some sort of collaboration with UMass, would be worthwhile. Um, and, and then on the other hand, you know, if you if you do find out that in general, parents and, and staff alike and students at the high school, however you, you find out everyone's really interested, then maybe maybe pool testing isn't necessarily a bad option um, to consider. But then I'm wondering, do you really need to go this route with, with the next step being Abbott? Can we start with doing the pool testing and then you know, if we find that there's a pool or selection that's positive, can then we, if we're able to get some sort of collaboration um, with some other um, community, again, just such as UMass, because Paul's been working on that, um, to do PCR testing from there? Do we, I don't know, do we have to follow the state? I can answer that for you, just that little piece, and then I'm not yeah. trying to interrupt you, I'll just answer that piece. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please continue. Um, the state, when, when we've gone to these webinars, the, the pieces that they've kind of hammered away at are you pool test, then you must do um, this. It, it, they, they didn't say it has to be Abbott Vinix now, but that's really what they pushed in terms of like the state has the, oh, help me out here, Tara. What's that called? That certificate, CLIA, where well, you can do testing. It's a, a some sort yeah. of certificate. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, so they may, but they've, you have to do a rapid point of care antigen test and they strongly recommend Abbott Binix now and they're making that the easiest. So then skipping to that step of, well, what if all those Abbott Binix now came up negative, you'd still go to the next step. That's not an option in their model. 
But again, what everyone's been saying, figuring out who's most likely to participate might drive what makes the most sense. So, yeah, I, I agree with you, Mara, that we should still continue the avenue as much as possible and as much as they're willing to consider the talk with UMass, because I think that that's, that would be a, a, a great allegiance for us, honestly. And I think, I, 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 I feel that once we start having our discussion, I think on February 1st, really about metrics, um, testing is something that really needs to be considered um, and parents need to think and staff need to think um, about the value that it could potentially add and provide a little bit more, um, for lack of a better word, more normalcy and consistency with kids being in school. I think that it's, it's, I think that if we can find a way to make it cost effective um, and um, available and realistic for staff to be able to complete, that it still could provide us with a lot of valuable information to provide consistency of being in school on a more regular basis, especially when there is now just a lot more information. It's, it feels like every week we're learning something a little bit new. Um, and there are health officials at the CDC that are warning people need to mask up. There's discussion about double masking. There's discussion about will everybody, will the recommendation going forward be wearing the N95s? They're saying by March variant is, you know, this new B, um, B variant through the UK is going to be very prevalent and widespread by March and in the United States and we need to do something now and so I just think figuring out now how we can provide any type of mitigation and I think uh, is important and I think testing is a really good opportunity for us to um, to start that I do I agree and it would be helpful it, to to figure out what is that product we want. And right. UMass might not work out. I mean, it, it, no criticism to them. They just, they got so much going on, right? And, and so we will have money. I mean, we have, will have 150 to $200,000 potentially from federal funds. Maybe if a new stimulus bill is passed, we'll have even more money. So what is that? What is the product we want? We want a PCR test for every community member, you know, faculty and students a week weekly basis. Do we want it just targeted to certain populations? That's the kind of thing that I could use help sort of identifying. And then let's just go buy that product. I called MedExpress today. I called CVS, right? These are companies. I said, can you process 200, 300, 400 samples a week? You know, what would your contract be for that? Why? We don't need to just stay with UMass. Let's just go buy them for on the market. And so, but I don't know what the product is I'm buying. And so the important thing when we look at that too is making looking at the accuracy of the results, right? So if the accuracy is not that great, then it's not really providing us with any beneficial information. So that's why when looking at- Is that about PCR, the company you're saying? I mean, their PCR tests, you're saying there's different PCR tests that we would be buying? Oh no, using a PCR test. That's no. what I'm saying. Whatever type of testing you're yeah, using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I see. I, yeah. I got it. Um, so like, what, what product, who are we testing, how often and using under what product? I get it, right? Yeah, um, and I haven't looked through just nationwide to find out if there are any districts in any other states besides ours that are doing regular testing. Um, any information that we might be able to well, find about. You what know, I've also called the um, um, private schools around here. Most of the private schools around here are testing. They're in school. I mean, Williston, yeah. it, kids are in yeah. class today, you know, they're, right. and they're testing. I don't know if they're testing on a weekly basis, but I, so I called them today to say, how are you doing this? You know, how much does it cost? Um, so, and you know, oh, the just governor's a, been really clear on that, that parochial schools have been in session this whole time, basically. Yeah, Paul, I was just going to add, I think I think Williston is testing at least once a week, and I think maybe even twice a week. So let's figure out who their contract is. How are they doing? Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to ask, has there been any kind of strategic thought about, to Paul, to your point about, the plan for testing and I guess maybe not with UMass, but just in general, like how often, when, with what group, have, has there been any preliminary conversation? Is that kind of where we're at right now? You mean amongst us or amongst? Yeah. I, I mean, I guess, I guess my, my question was going to be toward, you know, have you had that conversation with UMass and if so, what were kind of the, you know, what did you, what did you talk about with them? Well, just to I give us a sense it, I'll be honest because they're concerned about us, about the, they can't do all of our, K 
community, all elementary, Hopkins and faculty on a weekly basis. You know, that's what 600 people. I, I said that number and they paused, right? They're like, hmm. Right. Well, what if we targeted it? What if we just did administrators? That's X number of people. What if we did administrators in Hopkins and, and did that, right? So, you know, the idea being we've had many months of elementary students potted. And, and so if the kids are, and the studies are showing, right, the kids at the younger age, yes, can be carriers, but usually aren't as susceptible to the negative aspects of it. So what if the, the faculty and the staff were tested across the entire community, but we then target the older students for testing? So that's the kind of thing. No definitive. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm just sort of saying, how do we, if we were to put these pieces together, that's where I could use feedback. So I feel like we've always been really transparent from the get-go of um, the resources that we're utilizing to make our decisions and 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 um, the guidance that we're using. And we've always been able to pinpoint. So, right, when Annie sends out those weekly emails, she's able to really pinpoint and say, we use metrics from Harvard Global Health Institute and here they are and here's the link. And so I think, um, I think two things. One, I think that, I think it's great that other schools are doing the testing and I, I know they're testing at the Williston. I know that they're testing very frequently and I think it's great, but where did they decide what, what guidance did they get to decide how often to test, who to test and whatnot? I would want something from a public health official or some form of expert to really tell us this is the most effective way, right? Like, I don't want to just look at somebody like Williston and say, well, they're testing this much. So this is how we yeah. should do it. So I don't know if that information's out there or not. And then the, the, the thing that I think we also really, as quick, to be honest, as quickly as possible, finding out interest between students, parents, and staff will really help gauge us figure out the route that we can take. Because if we don't have a lot of interest and we know we're not going to get a lot of consent out of parents for students to test, then it's not necessarily worthwhile to pursue whatever bulk testing and doing all of our you know research based on testing x population so if we know who we're really looking at targeting i think it'll help us a little bit more answer that question i think you're right that uh, latter piece there's a great document i've been reading the johns hopkins bloomberg school of public health on uh, COVID testing in public schools and it, it, it breaks down all the different types surveillance and how much you need in that so you know i think that's a good place for us to start Mm -hmm. Can you send that out? Did you send that sure. out already? No, like you said, there's just so much. It's like every week. Can't you know, even something remember. New. Yeah. If you also, could, and Paul, if you send that, uh, if you send that, you can send it to everybody now. But also, if you make sure you send it to me, I'll make sure it's included in the weekly newsletter, okay. so families also see the materials that school committees, the school committees, looking at when they're considering options. Can I ask a question? Just oh, sorry, Humara, go ahead. No, oh, no worries. Uh, a couple of things about your points, Tara. Number one, uh, as it relates to modeling based on what other schools have done, I suspect that we'll have many more data points of other schools in other countries where testing has been a big uh, preventative strategy to great success. Um, in the US, a lot of the private schools seem to be of the you know older ages um, so I don't know that we're going to get a lot of data from K through six um, in, in terms of the U.S. So we may want to look abroad for what's been done. Um, and then the other thing I would say is I'm kind of reminded of the early days of deciding, OK, if we reopen, who will come? And in part, it's sort of like, OK, we, we need to uh, state our, our strategy. This is what we have. This is what we are going to do. And, um, and this is what we're going to do to mitigate, you know, being safe on the basketball courts or being safe, you know, with sports and moving around uh, in classrooms. I'm, I'm not, like in the absence of seeing what it looks like in the United States at large, let alone in Hadley, I don't know that surveying the community would give us an informed perspective I, I feel like people need to see what it's going to be like and what and imagine what it what it's going to be. So again, I, I like your idea of looking abroad because I, I understand that there's um, really uh, safe 
um, and non-identifying ways to go get yourself tested and you've got an app and you just sort of like verify by way of an app that you've, you're, you're in the clear uh, and it's not information that's shared, you know, broadly, but I imagine that something like that could be uh, helpful. But I think we need to benchmark first before we, tap, before we say, hey, would you without a model to look at? So one thing, you know, just about this testing, I think is important. It's it's part of a big picture, like you said, Humera, but not just, you know, the safety protocols, um, the distancing. That's why I've been keen in on this path to zero. I think it, it does the best job I've seen, and there obviously could be a document I'm missing, but it does the best job I've seen of articulating that whole holistic approach. You know, outlines, I think, what, six elements, trust, and, and social, you know, the infection control being the two one, vaccinations and testing being two others, but it's not reliant on any one thing. And, and I'll tip my hand for next week's discussion. What I like is, because I've been struggling with these metrics about what is, what is appropriate. And even, um, you know, Tara, you sent the stuff on the, from the American Academy of Pediatrics and it's great information. What gets frustrating is they don't tell you what to do, right? That all these things tell you that nobody's really telling you what to do. Um, and they, they say, yeah, kids should be in school. Here's all the risks. It's your decision, which is fair. I get it. Um, but the uh, path to zero really concentrates on metrics. They, they had originally had metrics of, you know, number of new cases per 100,000. They were at 25. And then they kind of just threw that out the window. And they said, we don't think that's the right metric anymore. You're just key in on in-school transmission. What are you going to do to, to mitigate that? And the academy... Pediatric says, you know, you should approach this knowing that your risk is not zero. You're trying to mitigate risk to an acceptable level. And that's where I think, obviously, we've argued. We all have different levels of what's an acceptable risk, just as the faculty and all the parents do, I'm sure. So how do we, I like that holistic approach of path to zero, and testing should be a piece of that. It's kind of hard to go get that testing product if we don't know what this full picture is. Like you said, Humira, we can't just say, if we're all tested once a week, we're all good and we can all take off our masks and go back to school. No, maybe even with a mask on, can you go back to school? Maybe not. You know, so how do we all put those pieces together and each individual piece of their own discussion points? So I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to put that puzzle together. I do know testing is probably a piece of it. Vaccination is surely a piece of it. The stuff we've all been doing is surely a piece of it, but that's where I think, um, for me, I start with path to zero is the, the best way to frame that discussion. I think that, um, I think from the perspective, at least what I had to present on testing, that that takes care of what I had hoped to hear from some of the school committee. I have heard how important it is to identify what might be the kind of the sources that will guide that decision-making or inform it and to be very transparent about that, to get clear um, based on those recommendations, what type of testing we're talking about, the frequency with which it would occur and being clear and honest with people about what that means in terms of that information. So what, what does that allow us to do? And it could be that what it, what it does is um, helps us to help the community. It could be that, it could be more than that, right? We just, but being clear about that. And then the importance of surveying people about participation. Humera, I, I agree with you. And I'm usually the first one to say, I don't like to ask people, people questions unless I'm 100% sure what it is I'm asking them to weigh in on. But maybe there could be two parts to this, just a general, like just to kind of figure out if there are people who would say, no way, no how, under no conditions. Like, I don't care what you cook up, I'm not consenting to test. Um, and um, so perhaps perhaps it's getting feedback, uh, kind of a quick dipstick and then a more uh, involved one after, if that makes sense. Um, and then with regards to, Paul, you talked about uh, framing a discussion and Tara, you brought up the idea of talking more thoroughly about metrics next week. Um, so I'm hearing since this is obviously a, a interest to the school committee, it has been for a while just to have a conversation and to think through this, it'd probably be important 
to um, set up a session with labor to um, discuss these things if that's something that the school committee thought would be productive. So usually when we're talking about things that have to do with working conditions and expectations for working conditions, we um, have an executive set of the school committee and the AGA has an executive session to start brainstorming through that. Am I hearing that that might make sense now? Yeah. I'd love to get their feedback. Absolutely. What those measures are, yeah. Okay, so I know we have two representatives from the HEA here, and uh, I certainly, again, these discussions are between the school committee and the HEA, so I don't know if Michelle or Becky, if um, that makes sense from your perspective. Yeah, it would, yeah, it would make sense to me. Okay, okay, great. I will get something scheduled. We do need to, uh, it needs to, we need 48 hours notice, so I'll probably be asking you folks to figure out maybe something on Thursday or even Friday just for this, but I'll talk to the HEA first. This isn't about my schedule, it's about the parties involved, but I will follow up first thing uh, tomorrow with school committee and, and the HEA. Can I just add something? Um, you know, I, we, we've talked a lot about this and school committee, you know, does deliberate in public in front of everybody without any further discussion. And so I just think it's important for faculty and staff to understand that this is something that, you know, we should be regularly reviewing because information changes, data changes, recommendations and guidance change all the time for the past year now, really about what's appropriate to do and what's not appropriate to do. And that the school committee, and I, I, I think I speak for everybody that, you know, it is, it is an important goal of the school committee to get kids back into school, but it's important to do so safely. And it's equally important to us to ensure the safety and well-being of our staff as well. And so with that, I think that it, it it's really important to have a frank conversation um, in, a, in a realistic conversation um, about how staff is feeling um, in their opinions on these different avenues that we're exploring as we're exploring them in order for us to ensure that we're making the best decisions um, and the most appropriate decisions um, to keep everybody safe and get everybody back in the school buildings, you know, again, as, as quickly as we can. So it's important to have just a real honest, um, raw conversation, in my opinion, um, so that we really um, are able to understand all perspectives. And I think it's great that Paul's doing the, um, the forum um, on Wednesday, um, because I think it's important to get that raw perspective and to be able to just really get some feedback. Um, and it kind of shapes um, how we are able to look at things. And it, it doesn't mean that the decision that's being made is gonna be, well, 60% of people wanna do this, is this is what we're gonna do, but it allows us to gain some perspectives that we may not all be thinking about on a regular basis. And I think an important perspective to keep in mind too is, is staff's perspective um, on how things are going in school and getting kids back and safety and, and whatnot. So thank you for being open. Thank you. Maybe if I could transition to that update and just mention this. I don't know, Heather, is that is now an appropriate time? Yeah, Paul, please. So as I mentioned, this Path to Zero, which is a document written by folks from Harvard and Brown and the New Foundation, which I found really compelling about a, um, a way to rethink of these metrics, because I've been thinking, I knew, knowing this conversation has been ongoing amongst us in the, in the school committee, you know, how do you think about that? CDC guidelines are rough, they're a little bit old, um, you know, old in COVID times is a couple of weeks, right? And so this is something that came out, I don't know if you all see Dr. McKenzie, Annie sends out this um, the references in the COVID library. So if you dive into that, there's a lot of great stuff. One of them is this Path to Zero, it came out sort of later in December. And it, it says, you know, really that what I find compelling is look at what's happening in the school. What is your rate of past in school transmission uh, and you're that basically they conclude that you can have kids in school following appropriate protocols uh, and really what you need to monitor is not what's happening in the community so much as what's happening in the school 
anecdotally, you know, that's rings with what I know with what's, you know, the, that's why we were talking about the data earlier about what is going on at the other schools. And just, I think anecdotally, you see, wow, that, that might be, that might be true there. I, again, as uh, Annie said, it's hard to distill out from that information, but there seems to be something there. So I wrote up a document that just to kind of distill that out to put my thinking in order and say, here's what I think is, I find compelling is the best, the trail of the best available information out there from this document, from the state, from what we've had. I put that together, and, but I realize I'm not the only one thinking about this. And I realize I could easily be missing something or there could be other ways of thinking about this, not just from a, a scientific perspective, other equally valid ways. And so I thought the best way to do that was just to host a listening session. So I posted it on the, the Facebook, Hadley Facebook page. I realize not everybody's part of that. Happy if folks are interested. I think Annie, you said we we're going to post it in some other fashion so that people can see it. It's Wednesday night, a Zoom meeting, 5.30 to 7. Uh, we're going to facilitate it in a way just to secure input. I'll send out an agenda uh, tomorrow, what day is today, Sunday. I'll send out an agenda before the meeting so that people have a sense of what we want to do. Really just trying to create a safe space to get feedback from folks on, does this document make sense to them? Are there other things I'm missing? Are there concerns out there? Partly for my own edification, but partly as because of what Tara said. There's... I haven't, school committee meetings like this are not a great way to have public dialogue, right? They're not formed like that. It's a one-way uh, conversation from you all to us, and then we talk amongst ourselves. So we've had listening sessions in the past. Um, I didn't, this one is really just me facilitating. It's not hosted by the school committee. It's just me to, to, to on that discussion, really concentrating on that path to zero. So again, I, I'd love for faculty, staff to participate. I'd love to get feedback on that. You know, what are your concerns? sitting in there, if you read this path to zero, to, and, and if we could do all those things in that document, would that give you comfort to bring the kids back? And, and same to the families. And some families have already chimed in on Facebook and said, nope, my kid's never going back until there's a vaccine. Totally legitimate, that's fine, that's good to know. But maybe other families think differently. Uh, and so how do we incorporate all those different perspectives in a form that's safe and so we're really going to work hard to try to facilitate a meeting where we can extract dialogue and, and keep it civil and keep it safe. Um, and that'll then translate into to inform our February 1 conversation as well amongst the school committee on metrics. Um, may I just say I um, appreciate the um, your desire to educate people. Um, should I, faculty... I'm, sorry, Michelle, I'm not necessarily there to educate. I'm, just to be clear, I'm not there to teach you anything or anybody. I'm saying this is my truth. This is what I think is important for me. I'm totally open to other perspectives. So don't don't go in there thinking that I'm going to try to teach you something because that's not my. No, that was a poor choice of words on my part. I'm encouraging people to educate them on all of it. Um, you invited faculty, and we appreciate that invitation. Um, we would just like, as an HEA um, board member, I would just like to, if people choose to speak as individuals, there it's for individuals, but the HEA board will be happy to gather. Um, information from a survey and share that directly with you during executive session. Should people choose to speak as individuals Wednesday night? Awesome, thanks. Thank Maybe you. Maybe that's something that the school committee have to, wants to, to do too. It wouldn't be necessarily something I'd institute on my own. But. No, I'm looking forward to going to the forum, Paul, on Wednesday. I'm looking forward to listening. I think when you say a listening session, it's also you want to hear from others, right? You are listening to them, not that they are, you are trying to impart all of this information to them. I mean, right. it's going to be a two way listening session, but I think that you are, as I understand from our conversation, that you are welcoming um, in this safe forum environment dialogue around um, considerations regarding, you know, uh, counter parts to what you've laid out in your document? What are some of the things that maybe um, are, are strengthening the argument in this? And what are the things that maybe we just, you know, haven't thought of in terms of, no, this needs to be one of the considerations on that path to zero. Exactly. Yeah. yeah well said. No, I'm looking forward to that. I think um, I'd also like to learn more. Maybe this will be my takeaway. I don't understand the interaction of testings and vaccines, and maybe that's just me not being an epidemiologist or in the health uh, 
field, but you know, we are talking a lot about, well, let's think about if testing is a key piece of our model moving forward, and we're trying to think about what might that look like, um, what does that look like when a vaccine is available to staff? Um, do you still test staff even if they've had a vaccine? Do you test them until they've got their second dose? Like, I just, I don't know enough about that, but I want to make sure we address that because the two are very much related. Yeah, great questions. And I think, you know, as folks have mentioned, how do you understand this all in light of the new variants that are coming our way? What does that matter? And Path to Zero, they cover that. They say they, you know, they feel their protocols are safe even within that. But, you know, that's, that's not based on hard data on their part, but more on their professional opinion. And so I think we need to understand it in, in, through that lens. I just wanted to add one thing if I could. Um, I think that, you know, as far as information goes about how far we can test um, or how long we need to look at testing post vaccination and whatnot, I think the important thing is to continue looking at it in conjunction with the data that's provided to us from DPH and paying close attention um, to demographics for our state about um, who's who's testing positive, who's becoming infected. Um, and, and really watching those numbers going down. And then again, finding out if there is guidance available. When do you stop testing? When is it safe to, when is it appropriate to? And one thing that I forgot to mention at the last meeting, um, I, I think it would be prudent of us to, to, to really pay attention to the age demographics because for quite some time now, when you look at those weekly reports, um, and, and it doesn't make sense. And I've sat and I've looked at the numbers and I've, I've looked with my husband just to try to figure out mathematically, like what, why is it that we're continuously recommending, um, you know, or, or stating that, you know, there's, there's no school transmission and I get it where the numbers are being reported in the state um, and that children are less likely to, well, I, of course, there's new information out that that might not be true. It's going to say less likely to spread, which may or may not be accurate. But yet, when you look at the state data on a weekly basis from DPH, the highest number of positive cases um, is the age group 0 to 19. They have the most positive cases. Why? I mean, I know that when we look at it, we look at it and say, well, you know, who's hospitalized, who's the most impacted, who's getting the most severely ill. And we get that the, the, you know, 70 above are generally the most impacted, but again, for quite some time now, the most number of positive cases are that zero to 19 group. You know, I just, I, I think it's important to watch that as we're thinking about testing. And I think that's why I think it's so important to figure out how can we make testing possible if we're going to have all these kids back in school. Um, but keeping track of that information as we're, Vaccines are rolling out as staff is able, able to get tested, hopefully, you know, as quickly as possible, not tested, uh, vaccinated as quickly as possible. Um, and how more widespread testing in the schools, if that's a district's decision, um, what that looks on those DPH numbers, what that looks like. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. While you're on the topic of vaccination, um, there is a, um, a resolution, a school committee resolution on vaccination for educators. And I would like any, if you wouldn't mind, um, I, I know it was posted on the Massachusetts Association for School Committees um, email list. I'm not sure how many have uh, approved it, but if you wouldn't mind um, maybe surfacing that it might make sense for us to um, put put that forth. I, I think it would be uh, prudent as a state, seems to me to make a very smart strategy to make schools safe um, by way of, uh, and we've talked about this before. This is nothing new. We talked about this at, at our last meeting. So it turns out that there is now a resolution. I think we should consider looking at it and passing it. Am I wrong or did today's announcement by the governor kind of move up priority for educators in that they were in phase two, but the second group 
Correct. Correct. So 75 and above is within phase two, which will begin according to the governor on February 1st. It was announced today. And in phase two, the first bullet is 75 and older, all the next bullet, 65 and older with comorbidity. The third bullet, essential worker list with educators leading the essential worker list. The, there is a um, letter that superintendents across the Commonwealth and union leaders are sending to Governor Baker, uh, Ms. Lynch, the HEA president, and I signed the letter along with uh, the majority of superintendents and union presidents in the Connecticut Valley that would be going to Governor Baker asking for educators to have access to vaccine even sooner. School nurses were officially included in group one and um, we're happy to announce that our school nurses were able to access that, which is just fantastic, which is absolutely wonderful. So um, yeah, right now, February 1st, that group starts in the bullet order I just described, but perhaps the letters that we're sending to the governor will um, make it happen even sooner for uh, when all educational staff, that isn't just teachers, it's anyone working in school districts. I think the problem right now in the Commonwealth, I don't think that Governor Baker is opposed to that idea at all. It comes down to uh, supply. I think he commented on that today. Unfortunately, I did not hear his remarks today. So um, well, as soon as- We've only utilized 43% of our vaccines and the rest are- Oh, safe. okay, so I'm mistaken, okay. And I understand there's second shots and all of that, but and different states have different strategies. Um, but no, be that as it may, everything about COVID is such a moving target and policies shift overnight, uh, depending on who's, <laughs> who's saying what. And I think uh, I still assert that even though we may have moved up in the priority, we, we, we still ought to pass a school committee resolution that affirms and strongly suggests that that be the case. I'll bring it to uh, February 1st. If you don't see it on the agenda, which I'll have to have out by this Thursday, um, then just remind me and I'll adjust it. But I wrote a note to myself. I'll make sure I look for it and I include it. Thank you, Annie. I have one question about vaccines and teachers, uh, staff in general, school staff in general. Ha has there been any talk about um, accessibility? So I I'm not talking about supply of the vaccine, but just simply making it easy for um district staff to be able to go and get vaccinated. So for instance, Cooley is going to be setting up um, vaccine clinics at various locations in the area um, that uh, any Cooley Dickinson patient can go to and um, sign up to go get their vaccine. I'm just curious. I haven't heard anything. I'm just curious if there's going to be anything similar to ensure that we're able to get vaccines quickly to um, any staff that's interested and willing. Have you heard it? So if you're asking whether or not we'll be able to um, administer vaccines on site, like stand up something on site, I don't know the answer to that. I do know I did include in the weekly newsletter a link, and I sent something to staff today after the governor's announcement that walks you through once you believe that your priority group is eligible, the link you click on, the vac where you can find the administration sites throughout the Commonwealth, what you have to bring, how you set up an appointment. Right. Aside from those tools, which are very helpful and very user-friendly, and I'll certainly keep putting the, for everybody, how will I know? It's, it's the section of the newsletter that says vaccines. How do I know when I'm eligible and where do I go? There's a link right there that takes you through it. That's for anyone in the general public. And if we hear that it can become even easier, right, that we could stand up something on site like we do for flu vaccines, and that would be fantastic. We haven't heard that yet, though. And I just want to be clear, I'm not necessarily suggesting that because given the storage capacities that are needed for these vaccines, it might not be something that's that's plausible for the school to be able to pull off something like that um, as far as, you know, temperatures. And there's a lot of guidance around um, how long the vaccine is stable outside of, of um, its required uh Temperature, so I don't, I don't know that that would be likely. I'm just curious if there's something more like, you know, a setup somewhere for clinics. So Sarah, I know, like you, I've been doing a lot of reading too, and I haven't heard anything about the local area. I hear that the state has like taken over Gillette Stadium and and other such yeah. big properties, but I haven't heard anything about this area. And I, I know at the federal level, they're talk, they're talking about deploying FEMA 
um, to different communities. But again, with cold storage requirements being what they are, I don't know, will they have to locate in the parking lots of places like Cooley Dick and other places that have cold storage? I have no idea. Um, so yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. Okay. Annie, I think you're muted if you were talking, but anything else on um, testing? I know it sounds like we've got uh, some good discussion topics for Monday planned for the agenda on the first and more information gathering. We've got a forum um, coming up on Wednesday, uh, Paul, that you're hosting. And then we have uh, the request here for a discussion with labor and getting that set up. Yep. Uh, this is just what I was going to show. It's not perfect. But um, it, this is just similar to what I have in the weekly newsletter. I'll make sure I keep putting it there so that people can see where, that, where sites are and when, as sites are added when you become eligible. And that's the Massachusetts DPH website. And if you look for you know, vaccine locations, Mass DPH. All right, great, thank you. Any other presentation or discussion items then for tonight? All right. Okay, we're gonna move then into the business manager reports. Chris, are you still awake and with us? Do we need to make you a co-host? Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> He's probably yelling, let me in, just like Ethan was. <laughs> oh, sorry, okay. No, 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 hold on, hold on. Sorry about that, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I was reaching for my phone to call you like I can't so, unmute. It won't let yeah, me. Yeah, it's the lonely world of the business manager, man. All right, there you go. Um, so first of all, I, I didn't know, Paul, if you had any questions about the where um, situation that we had a couple weeks ago. We had a cluster in one of the schools. Do you have insights into, was that in school transmission? It was I yes it was in school transmission yes so they're in they're in school now um, they returned today uh, those the students who were affected have not returned yet but we did shut the school down at that point in time and it reopened today oh, so it was open after Christmas and then closed and then reopened yeah we we've been um, hybrid since since the first day of school um, and two of the three schools have remained in hybrid but. It, this case was in the high school and we did close it down. Okay. And so there have been previous cases of in-school transmission then? Uh, no, uh, there have been previous cases reported, but no transmission okay. in the school. So this is Just right. single okay. cases that were immediately quarantined. Gotcha. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Um, so the first item I have is the expense report. I did a number of transfers um, as I had mentioned at the last meeting that I would be doing, I did move um, $450,000 of expenses from teacher salary accounts to school choice. We had budgeted more than that. Um, I, offhand, I, I apologize. I just don't remember the exact amount that we budgeted to use, but I'm thinking it was close to double that. Um, and so I, I moved that much out. I also made a number of transfers to grants, uh, you know, wherever they could be done. Uh, so what you see here is is a pretty good indication of where we stand at this point in time, and it, it leaves us in really good shape. Um, you know, we're looking at about just under 3.8 million dollars remaining to spend uh, for the rest of the year. So that does leave us in good shape, and it still leaves, um, again, about we'll, we'll call it 350 thousand dollars or so to be transferred to school choice uh, towards the end of the year. I usually break it up into two pieces. So looking pretty good as far as this goes. Some of the items um, that you may notice were over budget um, and there are always some obviously that are going to be over budget and others that will be under budget. Uh, but I just wanted to point out, even though it's, it's not a huge amount of money, um, the electricity uh, account is looking to be about eight thousand dollars over budget, uh, and that's that that's based on a number of factors, um, including you know rates that had slightly increased. But 
also just the number of items in the building that are running now, all of the air purifiers that we have, um, you know, they, there's certainly one in every room at least, uh, if not more than that. So that, that's going to increase the electric bill and even all the unit events that we got repaired in the first part of the year, there were a number of them. If you remember when we were looking to get those replaced and I showed you pictures of just a wire hanging with not really connected to any kind of power source, just there. And so obviously the, uh, the motor wasn't going to be functioning. Now those have all been repaired. So we have those working as well. So um, what you may have noticed in the bu budget is that with all of these factors in place, we actually did bump up for next year um, the electricity amount that we budgeted for. So just to reflect what would be our actual need. Um, other than that though, really, you know, there's not a lot as, as I've always said over the years, you know, if, if I'm not nervous, that's certainly a good thing. And uh, at this point in time, I'm certainly not nervous. So, um, you know, we are, we are looking really good as far as that goes. I don't know if anyone has any questions on the expense report. No. Okay, thank you. Um, then I can just switch over to the revolving accounts report. Um, again, some of these really didn't have a lot of movement in them. I mean, you can see athletic revolving has just outside of the money we spent that we had parked there for the athletic field project. There really hasn't been any activity at all coming from that account. Um, the lunch balance you can see has, has decreased by about half, but as you can see by my asterisk and note at the bottom, there was about $36,000 that did come in in December that hadn't been posted yet by the town. So if you add that to it, it puts us actually slightly above where we started the year at, which it was a very good uh, position to start at. So at lunch is actually looking really good this year. Uh, the preschool account, as I had mentioned at the last meeting, we knew we were going to lose money this year. And at this point in time, we did drop from a positive balance of about $5,000 to a negative of about 18. A couple of points to make for that. Um, it, you know, because of the timing, and I report these at the end of the month. Um, the January 1st payroll, which was a you know a New Year's Day, so it was a holiday, actually got paid on December 31st um, just because of the holiday. So that January payroll actually showed up in December, so that dropped it by uh, about five or six thousand dollars alone. So it, it made it look a little worse than it actually is, but I, I just wanted to point that out. Um, student activity account, again, just up and down a little bit. Hadley kids have stayed the same for months. Um, and the school choice you can see just reflects uh, the money that I transferred out of the account um, in December to move it, um, move the expenses actually to the school choice account. Any questions on revolving accounts at all? Okay. Um, and then I will just move over to the grant report. Uh, so a couple of these grants, the 102 grant, uh, the, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, that was a grant that we, we spent that one first because initially it was supposed to expire on December 30th. Um, I believe it was actually on December 29th, we got the word that we now have until June 30th to spend the money. But at that point in time, we had already spent it just in case um, you know, that, that extension was not going to come through. Uh, the ESSER grant is another COVID fund, and that one, we've spent some, but really not a heck of a lot. We are were, we were focusing all of it on the 102 grant just because of that deadline that we were, you know, we, we did not want to miss. And quite honestly, the same with the 118 remote learning technology. That was another COVID type of grant uh, that was expiring. It's beeping. Um, that was expiring on 1230 and again got extended till June 30th, but we had already spent it. So, um, you know, those, it, it was actually good to focus on those. Now we can use the remaining of COVID expenses in the 113 grant. Um, and the other ones, you know, the 140, the 240, um, I did move some uh, tuition expenses to the 240 grant and also some sped transportation expenses to that grant. Um, Title one, I, Title two, excuse me, is uh, just salaries are going to that. The same with Title one and Title four. So those will continue to just increase throughout the year. Uh, at, you know, with each payroll, we'll transfer funds into those grants. And um, you know, as always, they will be used up in full by June 30th of this year. 
Any questions? We actually got two more grants, which I, I forgot to include on them. They've been approved. Uh, we actually just got approval. I guess there's a reason I didn't put them on. We just got approval on Sunday morning. So um, at that point, I had already run the report and sent it out. But we did get two more that uh, Ann had applied for at the end of December. And um, they're, they're smaller grants, but nevertheless, you know, again, uh, we will certainly take them and I will add those to the report for next time. Well, congratulations on those. It's always nice to get. Yep. Any questions at all? No, no. thanks, Chris. Okay, thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Chris. Um, now we have, uh, let's see, updates, which I think we um, did share about the forum. Paul, anything else you want to mention about that? I wanted to add kind of an announcements update section for yeah. any kind of, you know, uh, meetings, uh, information that the town uh, would want to share or anything that uh, folks would find helpful to share and announce. And did you say you're going to post that Wednesday meeting so that folks are interested? It is posted at town hall right now because not because it is an official school committee meeting, but if three of you gather, then it has to be posted. The information is up at town hall and posted, and I will send it out just to make it easier for people as well. Thanks, um, I will go ahead and uh, I'll make Jane, otherwise she can't let us know. I don't know if Jane Nevin Smith had anything to announce on the town side. I think she's here. She wants you yeah, Jane, to Jane is here. You've made her a co-host. She wanted right. Jane if there's anything you'd like to share. I could make my computer work. Yes. Hi. There you are. Um, <laughs> no, I we're, I'm really pleased with the way you've worked your budget. That sounds good. Hopefully the town will be able to go level services. That's everybody's hope. But we haven't gotten the final numbers in on and our real loss is hotel room income. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a major, major thing. But also a lot of businesses haven't been open and so they're not renewing their licenses. It's all the domino effect, but everybody's working together. We're all in it together and we'll survive. Thank you, Jane, appreciate it. Thank you for all you do. Well, and it's great having you here um, for our meetings. I really appreciate the relationship and your um, attendance at these and listening. Um, any other announcements or updates? I'd love to make an announcement that um, we, um, for January and February, we have a two-part series um, for Hadley Learns. This is all about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our communities and in our schools. And uh, in January, we shared a couple of uh, movies and a couple of podcasts and folks could just pick from one, one of the many and come and discuss and learn from the other folks who might have watched a different movie. Um, and it was a very vibrant discussion. Uh, I was really heartened to hear one person say that in their 20 some odd years of living in Hadley, they've never um, met as many warm and inclusive people as they did on that uh, 90 minute um, Zoom. Well, we have another one of those sessions. Um, this time it's February 4th um, and it runs um, from seven o'clock to 8.30. The topic of this uh, February's um, session is uh, race um, and diversity and equ equity and inclusion as it relates to schools um, for great resources, again, movies and uh, podcasts so that people don't have to read a whole book to come and participate. They can get their head around the, some of the concepts, uh, important concepts. And, um, and I would actually say that a lot of the concepts put forth by these um, resources, it's helpful to race, but actually it's just common sense for learners in general. And I highly recommend, uh, if anyone's interested, just go to hadleylearns.com and you'll find more information about it in the events section. And Annie, it would be amazing if you could add that to your next superintendent uh, email. I'll make sure I do it. Usually I get either from you or somebody in that group sends it to me. So if you're out there, somebody in that group sends it to me, please do. And I'll make sure I get them there. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Humara. Um, I don't have an announcement or an update, but more a request for a future topic. And it does not need to be our next meeting. But at some point in February, 
Um, I would like us to talk about how we are, um, how we have been and how we're thinking about looking ahead, celebrating um, our senior class, as well as celebrating our sixth grade class that will be moving, um, stepping up and uh, moving into Hopkins. I think that the more that we can talk about just some of the, some of the things that already have been done, there have been some incredible uh, efforts undertaken by a number of families to really recognize our seniors and celebrate them in this year. Um, and I am confident that similarly with sixth grade as well, um, I'm just not as uh, directly uh, in touch with that. But I would really welcome, uh, even if it is bringing in some uh, guest presenters who have been directly involved in these initiatives to talk about what has been done um, and what it looking ahead to just some of the planning. Uh, it's, you know, it's February's around the corner and we know May will be fast upon us. And so just thinking about uh, really celebrating those milestones. Okay, uh, anything else for updates? I'm gonna move into action items then. Uh, we have a couple of things to approve here. We've got minutes from December 21st of last year. Uh, is any revisions, recommendations to those minutes? None, but motion to approve those minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We've got the approval of the accounts payable warrants that were submitted in December of 2020. Any concerns? Motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I, will, I will abstain from those. Uh, approval, of, approval of the warrants submitted from December 2020. So moved. Yes, yeah, seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, and then we had two uh, improvement plans, um, school strategy plans that were brought forward tonight. We do need to take action on each of those separately. So is there a motion to approve the Hopkins Academy school strategy improvement plan? So moved. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then finally, is there uh, a motion to approve the um, Hadley Elementary School school strategy and improvement plan? Moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, we do have a full slate coming up. We've got a meeting on the 1st of February, uh, Monday, regular meeting, <coughs> public comment. We'll review the public health data and metrics. We'll talk about testing. We'll talk about um, our regular school committee reports. And we will be, I'm sure, dialoguing about the activity that we just described um, that's happening this week. Uh, we still have our February 8th special meeting held if we need it to review the public health data. That's a special meeting with no public comment, but um, dedicated towards reviewing the, the latest data in the dashboard. We will not meet February 15th. I believe that's the week of break. Um, and then we will reconvene February 22nd, our regular meeting uh, and public comment with the business manager reports. Any questions about those upcoming? calendars in February. All right. Um, we do have executive sessions, so um, I will need a motion to uh, adjourn the uh, regular meeting and um, uh, essentially an entertain a motion to discuss, to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body. And I declare that an executive session is necessary to protect the bargaining or litigation pos position of the body and to um, then reconvene an open session. Is there a motion? So moved. Seconded. Okay, we'll need a roll call vote to enter into executive session. Uh, Humera? Aye. Paul? Yes. Tara? Yes. Ethan? Yes. All right, we will adjourn uh, open meeting and enter into executive session and conclude uh, the open meeting portion. We are reconvening in open session. Uh, looks like we have Hadley Media and we have uh, Mr. Pastorello. 
Um, we have now reconvened in open session and uh, we do need to take a roll call vote as we um, are looking to have a motion to accept the unit A contract that we have tentatively agreed to, which is subject to ratification by um, the Hadley Educators Association. Uh, I'll take a roll call vote for acceptance of this. Uh, Humera. Hi. I'm sorry. Can I just stop you? Who is the second on that? I need just a first oh, and a second. I'm okay. sorry. I, somebody needs to motion and second it. You're right. I'll motion. Okay. Second. Thank you. Ethan's got the second. All right. Mm. Uh, roll call vote. Humera. Aye. Paul. Aye. Tara. Aye. Ethan. Aye. Heather. Aye. All right. The um, motion is approved and I'll just thank, uh, I know Mr. Pastorello is on. I want to thank the HEA uh, for working with us um, as um, quickly and transparently and um, diligently as they did. That's much appreciated. All right. We uh, now, I think, can get a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor. Bye. 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 Have dinner, guys. I'm going to go home. Have a good night, guys. <laughs> All right, go home. Yes. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.